We are live and alive on the underground sound. And this week, I'm going to jump straight into it. We're going to <laughs> how parents become friends to their adult children. What what should they do? Why? When? And when? We can kick it off right right there. <laughs> All right, let's get started. This is. Uh... I think I spoke last time about uh, when parents should stop mothering and fathering and coddling. Uh, when the child turns 18, uh, he or she should be given an opportunity to shine with what they've taught them. Um, if you really, if you know, I'm a parent and I was very much like my mother and um you want to become friends with your adult children if you want them to tell you what's going on in their life. The ups and downs, the good and bad, you know, the mistakes without judgment. Uh, parents, um, you do one or two things as a parent. When you have a child, you take ownership, of course. Your protective nature kicks in. Safety is the most important thing. Making sure the child is happy and healthy. Uh, the toys, uh, the Christmases, and, and all the gifts, the birthday parties, and the cakes, and all this. And you get to do that for 18 years. And, and not to lose sight of the fact that your children do not belong to you. They belong to God. And your most important job is to teach uh, uh, job is to teach them about God. That is, what, that is what God says. You teach him, teach them about me. That's a very important thing. Um, regardless of your belief system, um, whether you're, you know, a different uh, belief system, you still will teach your children about your belief system, your spiritual system that every parent has for their child or should have. When the child grows up in your home and it's safe and it's protected and it's well fed and well clothed, uh, when they turn 18, you want to take several steps back and let them shine for you. Um, most parents can't take their hands off of a child and they keep looking at their children as children, regardless of age. And that is the first biggest mistake. Uh, once your girl or, or, or your daughter or your son turns 18, they are young adults. And once you show the respect of that, by that I mean no more control, no more protection, no more safety. And all those things should be lifted and you as a parent should be able to say, I did a good job. Uh, let me see, let me see how much I did teach my child. So you become, the first thing you have to work on is respect. Respect your young adult, no longer children, and just respect them as just another young adult. And when they see that you respect their choices, respect their privacy, and they're going to keep secrets from you, and they're not going to, you know, going into, even if the child or even if he or she is still living at home, you've got to get that child mentality out of your head. They are now a guest in your home and they're a young adult. And when you show them respect by not going into their room uninvited or behind their backs or, or while they're away, respect their space in order for them to grow their space into their own place. They got to first feel that respect that the parents will do that. So if you want to become your, your, um, your young adults friend, respect them, respect their space first. Don't interrogate where are you going what are you doing it's late and when they're 18 you got to 
take your hands off of the guy and girl and step back and then pray that they're learned enough from you to keep themselves protected and safe. Uh, most parents want to hang on to that. And I've seen many, many adults today that are crippled by that kind of coddling. They're afraid of their own shadow or they're even afraid to be anyone's friend. So uh, parents, if you want to be their friend, give them space. But the first place you start is respect. And when they see that you respect them as a young adult, they're going to begin to trust you with little things. They're going to test the water, say, you know, uh, I, met, I met a guy the other day and I really like him. And you could, she could be talking to her mother. And the mother needs to listen and say, well, tell me about him. What's good and bad about him? And then be quiet. And let her decide whether she actually will hook up with this guy or not. Uh, most parents want to know every sort of detail. Become friends first. Because, you know, when you become a best friend to your young adults, they will tell you everything. But you cannot react like a mother or a father. You are no longer that. You know, you have been promoted to freedom. You should be rediscovering each other since so much was so much time was poured into raising children. Is and, that uh, what you just said about uh, uh, being a mother and a father? Uh, is that is that why? Like one thing I've been noticing in my mm -hmm. life recently is like at my job, I interact with all these families. And I keep having these like amazing, incredible experiences where I'm like impacting people's lives and saying things. And it's like this incredible magic happening. But then I'm <laughs> like, why doesn't that happen with like my daughter? <laughs> you know, what I mean? like my daughter's like, man, eh, whatever. You know what I mean? When I say stuff to her and I'm just trying to figure out like, what is, what is that? How old, how old is the daughter, your daughter? 16. See, okay. Well, um, <laughs> When she turned 14, you probably saw a great change. Okay, when she turns 21, that is what everything you're saying that you don't think she hears, she does. Okay, cool. She does. And you just got to give her space, respect the fact that she is probably coming into her, her prime, a, a teenage life. 16 is a very important year, very important year. When she turns 21, you're probably, that's when you're going to see Everything that you thought she didn't hear, you'll be shocked to know that she has heard you and she has actually embraced it. But right now, her most important, her, probably some of the most important things is how she dresses, her best friends at school, her school probably, probably her church. You know, it's not that she's demoted you of being insignificant in your life, but when you're a teenager, you already know where mom and dad are. You just don't know where your life is. So her focus is to get her life full with other things. She knows her mom and dad will always have her back. But right now she wants to see what's out there. So give her space. Respect the fact that she says whatever. And, and we have a tendency to over talk our children. If, they, if you stop <laughs> talking... You know, over so <laughs> over talking is like overthinking. It can be a weapon or it can be very injurious to a relationship. So what I did with mine, I stopped talking. I waited till there was a question. I waited till she came to me. I waited before I knew it when I respected her at 16 and she was getting ready for just one more year of high school, she realized that, uh, wow, mom hasn't drilled me about anything. What's going on? She thought something had broken inside of me. And then she says, hey, you know, um, I met a guy. I said, cool. And I walk away. Learn to walk away. And then let them follow you because there's going to be another question. Until the questions come, the only time you intervene 
is wh how they are in your home as a guest. And uh, if she does something wrong uh, in, in her room, you need to clean this up, walk away. Say your point, walk away. And you'll be surprised that you said in very, and then if you use minimal words, minimal words rather than dissertations and interrogations and negotiations, you'll find that you'll get better results. Uh, parents over talk, you know, their kids are growing up and, you know, um, all of a sudden, and then what you have to do is, what do you, where are you going? Who is it? Where are you been? How long are you going to be gone? And, you know, all this stuff. She knows the legal act of her being underage. She's a pretty smart girl. She's in your family. And she's probably totally aware. If she is shining in school, if she's doing okay in school, yeah? Mm -hmm. She's doing good in school. That's all you could hope for. And now she's expanding her social life. This is when social, socialization do not include mommy and daddy every time. So let her expand and uh, say, hey, you need to clean your room, walk away. Hey, you need to do the dishes, walk away. Hey, you need to help set the table, walk away. Learn to walk away, then talk away. And that's what I tell people. Over-talking your teenagers, they're going to shut you out, and then they're going to shut out really valuable information that you may have to say at a later date. Let them ask the question. And uh, that's what I did to my daughter. She was a thespian. She was valedictorian. She, you know, she got all this stuff. She was a cheerleader. She had complete perfect scores in her, in her school. She was brilliant. I respected that. So until the question came, when she turned 16, she said, you know, I was just cooking a dinner. And, and I said, how was your day? And she goes, good. And that's all I said. She goes, mom. I think I met someone. I said, oh, cool. Help me set the table. I would change the subject every time. She goes, well, <laughs> you know, you know, she goes, oh, okay. And she, and she would be setting the table. She goes, and mom, you know, I said, I was, oh, you know, uh, by the way, don't forget to put the right glasses this time and all this stuff. I would change the subject and she was hungry for, to talk about this guy she had met and uh, a guy in, th in the thespian class. And I said, oh, okay, you know, and, you know, he's this, he's that. I said, you know, and I looked at her. I said, what's his name? She looked at me like, and she told me his name. I said, cool. He's got a cool name. Okay, let's uh, get this on the table and all this stuff. And I just kept changing the subject. And, and throughout the, we had the best dinner because of the fact that I did not ask a single question except what was his name or what is his name and she couldn't believe it she she just spilled and we became best friends that is when our friendship started when she was 16 not when she turned 18 but if you wait to become that kind of person in your children's lives at 18 it's going to be a little bit harder because you've got two more years of being a coddling parent a controlling parent and that means you have more experience of being what you shouldn't be. And it's too late to become their friends almost. Before you know it, by the time they're 21, they're not going to tell you anything. <laughs> and then you're going to just have to guess what they're doing. So start early. Because my daughter was so good in school, so active in many, many clubs, I kept her active. And uh, that's what a parent is supposed to do but when they start not wanting to talk not wanting to be questioned not wanting to be interrogated all i do is ask a simple question how was your day and then that's all i would ask or i hope you had a good day and before you know it my daughter told me everything and i most of it i was like my mother Click, hang up the phone. I don't want to hear anymore. You know, I want, it's none of my business. Once you turn 18, she goes, I'm going to do this. Fine. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and then she goes, what do you think? I said, no, 
go ahead and try it. It's what you think that matters right now. This is your life. Live it. I taught you everything I know. So live it. And you know, she raised her children the same way. Exactly the same way. So it goes down into history that until you become a trusted friend to your growing young adults that you call children, you know, when you start using the father card, like I'm your father, I need to know, or I'm your mother, you know, that's the least you could do. At, after the age of 18, those mother and father cards are going to be working against you in so many ways. You need to wait for the questions. You need to wait for the statements. And you need just to back off and let them show you what you have taught them. They hear everything we say. My daughter can even tell you, she, she was able to tell you, I remember when I was eight years old and you told me this, <laughs> you, know, like, Whoa. <laughs> you know, and it's, they hear you. But right now, a 16 year old male or female child, mommy and daddy are going to be right where I put them last when I left this morning. But now, you know, I've got to figure out where I fit in in this teen world. And the peer pressure is huge. So leave them to it. They'll come to you if they want an understanding. But when you overtalk them, you're not respecting. You're controlling. And they're going to take it that way. There's no other way to take it. Even though you love them to death, and the reason you're talking them to death is because of the love, sometimes love is silent. It just happens, right? Love is silent. And uh, I remember one time my daughter at 16, she says, Mom, what do you think about this, this, and this, and this? And I, I, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't answer. Because it was a, the dumbest thing I'd ever been asked before. <laughs> so, so I just simply got silent. And I, um, I, you know, I was either reading a book or I was sewing or, um, or cooking and she goes, Mom, did you hear what I asked? And I nodded my head, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> she goes, well, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? I said, I turned to her. I said, if you don't understand my silence, you're never going to understand my words. And I walked away. She goes, well, wh 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 what is that supposed to mean? And I said, it means that maybe your question didn't quite sound intelligent. You want to rephrase it for me? And she did. She actually pulled into her. Some of the questions they asked you, like, you know, I, I would just, and my, my brain would just go snap in two. And I said, what, what is that about, you know? So she finally used logic and, and asked a, a sensible question about something that was happening in school between her and another girl. And uh, because she was rambling and yammering, so I get quiet. When people are already over talking to someone, the person that they're talking to, the best thing for you to do is be quiet. <laughs> Just be quiet until, until you can make that statement that please make it make sense what you just asked, you know. So I think um, to become your young adults in your family's best friend, respect. Respect their space first. Do not go into their stuff. Don't snoop around as if, because they're still living at home. Don't make them run away from you and, and, and never tell you where they live because they will do that. They will run away from you and they won't even tell you where they live. Because you, the, the mothering and fathering, it can be suffocating to a young adult. They can feel like they're being suffocated and being choked to death by the very people that are saying or claiming to love them. So now respect is a different type of love. And the friendships that you could have with your young adult family. Oh, my God. Uh, my daughter told me everything, and it got to a point where I was hanging up the phone more than not. You know, I don't want to hear it. Don't come to me. I'm not dear Abby. 
other than that, how's everything? <laughs> you know, and, you know, and that's what you have to do. But at 16, this is where discovery is the most important thing. And if something really happens that they don't have any experience or heard from you or Ashley before, they'll come to you in their own time. Uh, daughters will manipulate their fathers like crazy. Sons will manipulate the mother like crazy. And it, it just, it just the way it is. That's the way we're built. We're just built that way. But your daughter will come to you when something happens that she doesn't know about yet and wait for the question. 16 is a good time to be her friend, be her buddy more than anything else. And uh, zip it, zip it. Yeah, just zip it. Over talking will over suffocate, over stifle, and it will break. She won't be able to trust you because you're talking her to death. What you want to do is you want her to live. So until she comes to you with a question that she hasn't learned yet, she may she may even source it on social media. She may even Google it or or you know duck duck go it and search it online. But if it doesn't make sense to her, the people she does trust is you and Ashley. So you would probably be the go to first. Can you tell about. kids that are 16 years old, like hard truths? Can you tell them stuff that's like hard to hear, but true, you know? I, I don't understand the question completely. What do you mean by hard truths? Like a hard truth would be, um, uh, you know, I, and I don't, I don't like, like you just said, manipulation, like my daughter will manipulate like crazy. And I've told her sure. that. Sophie, you're yeah, man- but don't no, don't use that word on her. Just stop it. What you do if if she's manipulating you and the the last thing she just say no, and or ask her to rephrase the question or request to where you can better understand it. What she's asking. Okay. Always don't call them to the mat. That's not a hard truth. That's like in your face, and when you're in her face. She's not friending you. She's actually making you an enemy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so just say, could you rephrase that for me, please? Then I can better understand what you're asking for or what you're needing. And then zip it. Let her think about it and let her do it again. And if you still feel manipulated, um, I didn't quite understand that. Can you try one more time? Zip it. Until you get the question to where you no longer feel manipulated. My daughter was a master at manipulation, but not of me. Because I just wouldn't answer. <laughs> just say, <laughs> she goes, hey, hey, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Well, she used to just, I'm talking to you. Gosh, you know. And then sometimes just to really get a rile out of me, she goes, Cha, I'm talking to you. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even respond to that. I, I wouldn't even react to that. She goes, Mom, ma, mother, mother. And then she went to mother, which is more formal and more respectful. She goes, did you hear what I said? And I turned around and I said, if you can rephrase what you're asking or demanding or stating in a more sensible way than where I can understand what you're needing from all this conversation, then maybe I can help. And she would rephrase it every single time. But I never told her she was manipulating me because then they learn a new word. <laughs> you know? And if they if you if you name something that they're doing it, you've just given it so much power that it's going to be harder to get rid of the strength of it. What if they lie to you and you know it? Um, if you they. Have- you don't tell them like, hey, that's a lie. <laughs> Stop well, lying. Well, the thing is, is that uh, I use a really good phrase. Uh, I think I, I, I would hate to say this as a general rule, but most uh, teenagers will do what they call white lies. And all I would say is I don't believe a word you just said. And I walk away. Mm. 
I don't call them a liar. I don't label it because when you label something, you give it more power. So I just say, I don't, I personally do not believe what you just said. Walk away. Yeah. And I said, and, and that's just my opinion, but what do I know? I usually say that too. And I walk away. I don't label anything that's wrong because the more you label it, the more layers of wrong it is. And um, they're going to tell white lies to get something. But if you know it is a white lie and you know it's not quite true, I always say, you want to try that again? What did you just say? You want to try that again? And, and you will never get the same response every time. So you know then it's untrue <laughs> for sure. Because, you know, when you lie, you have to keep up the same story. And uh, it's hard to keep. When you haven't lived it, it's not the truth. So I always say, I don't believe what you just said. Try it again. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that that's way less. Uh, I see what you're saying. Like it makes yeah. it not this uh, accusation. Kind exactly. Of, you exactly. Just like, and you're just dissipating it. Like. I, yeah, exactly. I'm taking an eraser and just erasing it from my brain. <laughs> it's what I'm doing. What I just heard. <laughs> I'm just, I, I, you know, white whitewash it or whatever you want to call it but i do i i remove it from my brain i said just try that again you want to try one more time and if she doesn't say anything i walk away just and then she just yeah and, and and the realization is that well I, that didn't work let me try something else and she did try sure and i keep repeating myself i don't believe what you just said i'm sorry that's just my opinion you want to try again I would just repeat myself. And it got to a point where smoke was coming out of her ears, but I didn't care, you know? Yeah, because you're I like, I'm not, I'm not buying into this game. I'm not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. And I, uh, you know, and that's when the trust began. At, at really, at 16 is a really good age. Uh, but if you have a young adult family still living at home, over the age of 18, um, it's really hard. It's going to be really hard to befriend them, but it doesn't mean it can't happen. Stop asking questions. Stop bugging them. Stop checking in on them. Stop calling them every day. Stop wanting to talk to them every day. Those days are over. Those days are over. Parents want to hear from their kids every single day, you know? And I said, why? <laughs> I was so glad when my like, daughter turned life, huh? <laughs> I know, really, you know, you know, gosh, you know. So I didn't need to talk to my daughter every single day, even though I had only one child. You would think that I would be more of a coddling mother and hanging on to her because I had only one. But no, I was so glad because I could travel. I could do this. I could go scuba diving. I did all kinds of stuff, skateboarding, you know, and I wasn't tied to a phone. And, um, I didn't want to hear from him. I said, don't call me every day. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you I'm fine for the next month. I'm fine. If something, <laughs> if, if something is wrong with me, I'll call you. Promise. But let me hear from you next month. Click. That would be it. I don't need to hear my daughter every single day that she's fine. And I said, whenever there's something good new, give me a call. But don't call me every day. Just say, how are you doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. It becomes so uh, annoying. And, you know, <laughs> it does. Because, you know, when, when, your children, when your children are grown up and they're 18 and, and they're fending for themselves and they have a job, and they, even though they're still living at home, let them live. And you start living again with your spouse. And, and, you know, rediscover each other and go on a, a weekend trip without having to worry about an, a legal age young adult family member. You know, just let them go. Let them go. Become their friend by showing them that you are enjoying your life without them. And they will want to friend you because you've respected them as a young adult. And that's where it starts. My daughter told me everything. When she joined the Navy, she was in the Navy, what, eight years? 
and um, she uh, was a helicopter mechanic, and she was in New Zealand and Australia. She went to all these countries, and this is what I taught her. The world is really small. I said, go out and see it. So what did she do? She joined the Navy, where they their advertisement is that see the world. <laughs> you know, that's the reason she joined the Navy. And I didn't question it. She goes, Mom, I joined the Navy. I go to boot in a couple of weeks. I said, fine. I said, what do you want for your last meal at home? That's all I said. She goes, I want everything that I love. So I made every single dish. I made her favorite cake. I did everything all in one meal, which she had all these leftovers. And she and I had a party. She wanted me to cut her hair because they knew they were going to cut her hair. So I cut her hair. And uh, we had all this wonderful food that was her favorite growing up as a child. That's what she wanted. It was her last meal at home. The last supper. <laughs> the last supper. Literally, it was the last supper until she visited me, you know, with her husband and children and whatever. And we, we would both cook together. But it was her last supper from her mother. She was no longer a child. And uh, she had a scholarship coming to her. She could have gone to college right away, but she wanted to go into the military. I said, okay, fine. So when she left, um, and she, she said, I'm taking the, I'm going to take a taxi. I don't want you to drive me. Uh, I got to go to the bus station now. They're, they're, we're meeting everybody there in a couple of hours, and I want to be early. And I waved her, I waved goodbye and kissed her and hugged her and told her to do the best she could ever do. And, and then uh, sh sh the taxi pulled away with my daughter. And I went inside and I dropped to my knees and prayed to God and cried my eyes out. But she didn't see that. She didn't need to see that. You know, and I, 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 my, my girl was growing up. She made a huge life choice. And I respected that. And that is where, why we're friends. That is why you can, we were friends. And this is what she wanted. It's not what I wanted for her, of course. But she never, she never failed me. Later, you know, the reason she had to get out of the Navy, she got pregnant. She got married and she got pregnant while she was in the Navy. And uh, the Navy, she, they, you can't be pregnant. And so she did her last stint and uh, she had her baby. Then she had a second child. And then she decided to go to university. And she became an RN. In her first year, she made Phi Theta Kappa with two children. Her husband was still in the Navy, so he was not hardly at home. He was always abroad. So she did exactly what I taught her to do, survive. And she planted her gardens, just like I taught her. She taught her children how to plant a garden. She made Phi Theta Kappa with two, juggling two children under the age of five. So, you know... My kudos to her. Respect, of course. And she knew it. And then when she could call me when she was in the Navy from New Zealand or whatever, um, she would uh, call me and we would talk for five or ten minutes. And she would did it through some sort of, uh, they had a radio system where they could call a home. And uh, ten minutes is all I wanted. <laughs> You know, 10 minutes is all I needed. It's because I wasn't her mother anymore. I was her best friend. You know, and that's what you have to do. Become their friends. Respect first. Respect their space. If you want to see their face, you have to respect their space. No more questions about what you're doing, where you're going, you know, who you're seeing, and all this nonsense that parents continually do to their young adult family. And that completely destroys any hope of that child ever coming to you and say, listen, I wanna to talk to you about something that has great happening to me or something bad that's happened to me. You will be the last person to know about it and you will be the one they'll say, why didn't you come to me? And they will probably will say, you, don't know how to stop talking. <laughs> You'll talk me to death. You talk me out of it, in it, whatever. And you always have solutions. And I'm not asking for that. 
I'm asking you to be my friend. Just listen. Sometimes listening is just as just as much of a gift than giving your opinion. Wait for the questions. I always tell people that. Wait for the questions. When people come to me and I can tell that they're not feeling well, I don't say a word, even though I can feel their bodies are really in bad shape. I wait for the question. So a question for you. Where do you start? <laughs> Where do you start on the daily improvements of your seven facets of wellness, starting with spiritual? Where do you start? Prayer is free. You can do it anywhere. There is no special spot. Even though I have, uh, I have a prayer window, I have a prayer altar uh, in, my, in, my, in our home. And I've always had that. And I... I put people at the foot of the cross a lot. Where do you start? Is that first of all, um, first you know, ask God if if it's okay with Him, if He will just take over your life from this moment on. And um, it's like attitude of gratitude, uh, just like. Um, uh, Denzel Washington said, attitude of gratitude, all this love and all this talent and the laughter and the smiles that you can bring out on someone is, is designed to, for you to give it to someone, anyone. So every day when, uh, when we were living in, in Santa Monica and Venice Beach area, I would see homeless people and uh, a homeless guy uh, looked hungry, and I always, when we ate at the firehouse, and they're so used to serving bodybuilders, so when I ordered a meal, it was like for like 10 people for me, you know, so I would only just take a portion out of it and have the waiter put the other portion, you know, to go, and if I saw someone on the side, I would ask him, are you hungry, and they would nod, and I would give them uh, my food that I didn't touch. I said, I didn't touch it, you know, um, and I made sure that there was, you know, spoon and fork and knife in there for them. And the face of a person that's hungry receiving such a good meal is priceless. It's something you cannot buy at any department store. So that's where you start. Learn to give and give the first thing you do is you give yourself to God. You know, if there's anything you can do for me, Lord, here, take me. Take me and please enter my heart and, 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 and guide me because, you know, I lost my job or I'm having trouble with my family or, you know, take your problems to him. And But when you do, take your hands and mind off the problems because he doesn't need your help. As long as your hands and your mind are on your problems, he cannot do any his work. There's too many, too many cooks for one pot of soup. So learn to, to for the first thing to do is he teaches you to give. And you say, I don't have anything to give, you know, I'm broke or I lost my I'm this, that, and the other. First thing to do is give yourself to God. And ask him for guidance. And then listen. Just listen. He will show you. His plan is so divine. And uh, literally, <clears throat> there are no blind people to seeing what he has in store for you. Your life will change in that moment. He will lift you from your knees of woe, even though you still don't have a job. Just wait for his plan to work. So spiritual component is where you start with yourself. It doesn't include anybody else. It's about learning to give yourself to God and your problems that is weighing you down. Allow him to carry. Because there are times, there are many, many times where we pray for something, but we won't take our mind or hands off of it. And we can't figure out why God's not gotten to you yet. 
It's because your hands and your mind are still on it. It's just like recently losing a very close, dear friend. I literally, I literally fell apart in almost every call. I had to cancel my calls and I had to cancel with you too, Scotty. I couldn't, my mind was on my friend that was gone and I just couldn't, I was being a typical human, a female human with a great deal of emotion because this is a, a friend that I've eaten with, laughed with, smiled with, who's gift, given me such wonderful things like flowers. And uh, he used to, he told me flowers for the floor, you know, or flowers for the flower. And, uh, and it was, it was really hard for me to wrap around the fact that he was, I was never going to hear his physical voice again. So I went into this complete pity party and finally, I wrote his name on a post-it. And I put him at the foot of the, my crosses under my pillow. And ever since then, I haven't shed another tear. In fact, I'm celebrating the fact that I even knew him. Celebrate the fact that we even ate together, laughed together, smiled together. And I got to meet his, his wife today. And we all were spending really good time. So those are the things that I'm doing to keep him alive in others. And, and that's what you have to do. Spirituality doesn't mean you have to be a Bible thumper and you have to read a chapter in the Bible. But it probably wouldn't hurt you to try to read a chapter, you know. But, you know, I'm just saying that I read the Bible with a Matthew Henry commentary because I, I, I didn't understand a word some of the Bible said. And, and so the commentary... It was written by 12 or 13 theologians and the Matthew Henry, and it helped kind of put it in lay terms to where I could understand the word of God. And even I, I attended so many classes, Bible study and you name it. I've been, and, you know, being in a doctorate in divinity, you have to know a little bit about the Bible and all this stuff. And you, you just it's just such a big they say, well, it's contradiction. I said, well, you've got to remember when it was written, who wrote it you got to understand, people all have their own interpretation. You know, when I say, you know, when you say the Lord's Prayer alone, you know, our Father who art in heaven, if you ask 12 people, what does that mean? It would have 12 different connotations of the meaning because this is what free will is about. And it doesn't mean anyone is right and it doesn't mean anyone's wrong. So... Spirit, being in the spiritual facet of your wellness, that in itself, well, all of a sudden your body, your soul takes a shift and it can't help but evolve to your mind and it can't help but evolve to your physical and suddenly you have some sort of strength left, some strength that's come back in your mind and your body so you can handle what's at hand, what the problems are that you're facing. And be believe it or not, uh, I had so many people that I can't find a job, I can't do this. I said, go to the grocery store, go to a steakhouse, you know, go to a fast food restaurant, do anything, flip burgers for a while, get some experience, socialize, learn to be and work with other people as a team. This is how I fixed a lot of problems. I said, you're looking for an office job that doesn't exist and you don't have enough experience, so get experience. Socialize, talk to people, and start reading like crazy. Yeah, well, not 25 books a week, but you know, start reading like crazy. And and I and I think, I think that's where people think that spirituality is. Oh, you know, I've got to, I've got to go to Bible study, and I got to go to Sunday school, and I got to. You don't got to do nothing because it's really between you and God. But. If one or more, I mean, if two or more people gather in my name, he says, he will hear us. So invite a friend. Invite your best friend. Say, hey, you know, just being together and praying together is so powerful. Two people, two or more. That's all he said. He didn't say two million or more. He said two or more. He made it quite simple. So if you don't have a prayer partner, get one. You know, if it had to be your cat for a while, so use your cat. I mean, you know, 
and 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 you know it's it's two or more he will hear you but make sure that what you're praying for make sure what you're praying for that he also knows your heart are you willing to work for what you're praying for are you really willing to do the legwork the physical leg was going to take to get a job that means you have to get up pretend that you're going to the office Pretend that you're going to work, shave if you're a guy, you know, shave, clean yourself up, comb your hair, put on some decent clothes like you're going to a job interview. When I lost my job and I got laid off, like most of us did one year, um, every morning I still got up as if I was going back to the office. I dressed like I was going every single day and then I would go and do my resumes and I would post out 10 resumes or seven resumes every single day monday through friday and that's what you have to do you have to be willing to work for what you pray for you can't just sit there and pray and act and expect god to deliver at your front door like dhl you have to actually do the work and but believe it or not when you give your life to god you will have the stamina the desire the 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 will and you'll have the strength and the power to do exactly what your prayer wants of you. You'll have it all, because he does not scrimp. He knows what you need, but you also he also needs you to make sure you listen and you feel. You know, um, when my, my friend passed away, I, I, all I felt was grief and a loss and it was a selfish it's a selfish loss because I won't ever hear his voice again you know I had him in my whatsapp and I won't ever hear his voice again and uh, we uh, it's it's almost like um, I, I felt like I was being robbed of something and so by putting him to the foot of the cross and turning him over to God um I was able to really capture how wonderful, how wonderful it was to even know him, how wonderful it was to uh, eat with him and his wife and laugh with them. We were at an, an event together. And so it was a wonderful time. Then they came and brought me for my birthday some orchids, some, you know, and I had to sneak them on the plane in my luggage. I had to pack the orchids in a pot, <laughs> all three of them and in my luggage and I actually abandoned some clothing so they would fit and um, it was uh, I'll never forget that I'll never forget what he had done in my life and and so that's what you do with with spirit with your spiritual facet on the rise the other facets the next one is the mind the mental all of a sudden your mind changes all that negativeness is being neutralized slowly, but fast enough to where you can gain some mental ground again. And when your mind starts to flow, then you become creative again. What is it that I need to do to fix this problem that's crippled me? And um, what the mind does after this, the spirit, the mind, the physical, all of a sudden your physical is able to carry you out of bed as if you're going somewhere and do the right thing. Prepare yourself for a prayer being answered. And that is what has to take place. With until, until the spiritual facet and the mind facet and the physical facet of yourself, you have to learn to love yourself, respect yourself again. You have to Take care of yourself. Groom yourself. Be ready for whatever, whoever knocks on your door. You have to be ready. And you have to be prepared. You can't be in your pajamas all day and expect things to happen. So once you get those three facets in the beginning, then all of a sudden you can start thinking about career. You can start really thinking about how you're going to apply this strength to a career of your choice. So you don't get the job you want right away, and it's gonna take a little bit of schooling, but do something. 
do some sort of work, go to night school, as I did, and life will only get better. For, from career, your financial facet, the financial facet of wellness, all of a sudden, you're able to meet your, your, um, your deadlines, pay your bills, pay your way, eat good food, you know, put some money aside. And then you can start thinking about family. You know, you can start thinking about family. But before family is going out, treating yourself once a week with not much money, maybe go out and have a meal, invite some friends, you know, and have a meal together and laugh. So socialization is very important in wellness. In wellness, you have to be social. Once you're social, then the family orientation, if you happen to meet someone, you're laughing, happy, employed, financially stable, physically strong, mentally strong, and spiritually sound. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to hook up with that and meet that? So there is a chance of you having a family. So those are the things that, you know, most people think of in the wrong order of life. They think of family, let's get spiritual. Let's get mental, you know, and, and you go about it all wrong. So it, you have to become spiritually sound. So the mind is changed. And then once the mind is changed, the mental is stronger. The physical has no choice but to follow. Because when your mind is good and you go, you start working out and you start exercising, you start walking, you start doing something physical for the body to improve, then you're able to really focus on career. And then you can career, you, you want to make sure that that facet is thought about every day as well and because the financial comes and you keep yourself financially healthy and then the, you socialize a little and your chances of enduring social, being social, you can meet someone of the, your dreams just by mistake because you have become something. And when you become social, then more than likely you'll meet a family person. So, and then that order, it works. So, what did I miss? <laughs> I think uh, there's one. Say, did you cover the physical? I mean, I know, I know you mentioned it, but. Yeah, the physical, yes. Like, what, how do you address that? Like, what is important there um, for physical? Like, is it your nutrition? I know that you're big on nutrition. Yeah, I am. Is that the key to physical health and wellness? Of course, of course. 90% of physical health or physical wellness is food. 90% 90, 90 of performance by the physical is food, nine, nine zero. The other 10% is the, the weights, the gym, the running, the biking, the hiking, all the other physical exercises that you want to do. The walk, you know, just walking even, you know. And it, it, but 90% of your fuel, it's like buying a, you know, a Ferrari and just putting diesel in it, <laughs> you know, putting the wrong fuel in it. What do you think is going to happen to that engine and all the computerized systems? It's going to break. So the body breaks when it's not fueled correctly. The body becomes ill and breaks. And it, it gives you good subtle warnings. And if you keep eating pizza and beer every single day and you calling it food, you know, you might want to throw some greens on it. And you might want to, you know, do a piece of fruit afterwards. And you might want to get rid of the beer not every night. You know, there is a way you can neutralize what, what you know, everybody says junk food. I have no junk. I had pizza the other day. And I put the most spiciest sausage on it. And it, it was so spicy I was crying. But I put a lot of raw vegetables on it, slightly cooked. And I eat it with so many greens and so many vegetables that I didn't even feel the pizza. I felt great. So your fuel 
can be neutralized. Junk food, if you, if, like you say, well, what if I want a hamburger every night? What if I, that's the only meat that I like is a hamburger? Drag it through the garden. Just throw so much green stuff on there. Anything raw that you have, slice up a carrot, put a cucumber on it, and eat the whole thing. You know, you're telling me I can have the hamburger and the bun? I said, yep, you can. As long as you drag it through the garden, you'll be fine. <laughs> what, about, uh, what about your mental uh, wellness? Is that reading books and like how do you um, address that facet of wellness? Okay, once once you uh, decide to give yourself to God and or uh, give yourself to a belief system, and you study it, there has got to be some studying every single day, and you have got have to get a better understanding of how to ask and how to pray, there is no prayer 101. Just simply ask. Your prayers will become stronger, more precise, more sensible. So your mental mind will improve at that level. Uh, as far as your mentality, your whole demeanor and attitude about life is the first thing you have to do every day is be grateful that you have another morning or another day. That's the first thing. First thing in the morning before anything else, I go to my prayer window and I say, thank, thank you, God, for giving me another morning. Thank you so much. I feel pretty good. I'm a little, or I'm a little tired or, you know, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for giving me another morning. I'm never, I've never missed a day thanking him for another morning in as long as I can remember praying. Every day I think, I, I just look at the sky and I say, thank you so much. Oh, this looks like rain today. And I have a little conversation. Not bad on the clouds. You did a good job with the sky this morning, you know. And I actually have a conversation. It only takes maybe one to three minutes to do that. But that's how you set your day for the mind. And I try to learn a, a new word or something new every single day. Something I didn't know that has completely unrelated to anything in my life. And uh, I will learn something new. And that improves your mind. It gives you experience, something else that's unrelated to you. Learn, learn a new word every day. That's going to improve you. You know, learn how to put that word into a sentence. That's all you have to do. You can take, you can start with the dictionary and just... Open it up and look at the word of the day and learn how to use the word in a sentence. And before you know it, you're going to be using it in conversation when you socialize. And that's going to make you sound pretty mental. <laughs> so your spiritual and your mental really go hand in hand then, like totally. Well, no, all seven facets go hand in hand because it's like a domino system. Mm. It's, it's not like, okay, five minutes here, five minutes here, five minutes here, three minutes here. It's not like that. When, when I think, when I say my morning prayer, I'm thinking for my mind that my mind is improved, that I'm grateful. My mind's already improved. My mental st stability, th thank you so much for another morning. What a beautiful sky. You know, the trees are beginning to look a little bare. It looks like winter is here. And this is my, in my mind. And then if my mind is feeling so rich with a new day that has never been repeated, not one time in my 72 years, my physical body feels it. And I get up and I said, OK, you know, let's do some coffee. Let's fix some breakfast. You know, I'm rocking and rolling physically. You know, and then, you know, you talk to Tom and, and Tom says, just give me coffee, you know that type of attitude and it's like you you are socializing already and you have family already and and it goes on and on and on and then you know if it's on the weekend I don't usually work on the weekends but if it's a Monday I hit the ground running with my career you know running the brand and and then I check the financials and, and usually once a month I'll check the fine but I think about the financials but once a month I pay everything for a couple of months and I don't have to think about it again so you, you might, everything walks hand in hand. You know, you got the spiritual, your mental, your physical. Then you've got your social. Then you've got your family, right? And you got your career. 
career, financial, and family. Uh, all of those things really, really help you to, to be, if you think of the facets, if you do something in every facet all day, you have reached the top of your wellness for the day. And I do it every single day without fail. Every single day I work on, a, on all my facets without fail. And the reason I do is because of the fact that um, most people want financial and career, right? They want financial career and then family. And then let's hope we can put God in there somewhere. Uh, you know, <laughs> so my mind will be better and maybe my physical, I won't be so chunky. So the thing is, is this, you have to start with yourself before you can offer yourself to another. So it just, you're completely out of order, so to speak. You have to become one with yourself. You have to be comfortable in your own skin. You have to love yourself, not worship, love yourself, respect yourself, take care of yourself before you can even begin to think about being sociable with other people, before you can even think about family with another. You know, before all of that, you have to get a career, right? So before socializing, getting a family, you need a career in finances. So you're working on all that. So that is why the physical goes right into career, goes right into Financial, then you social, then you get a family. That's how it should really flow. So the order matters. But I work on every single facet every single day. Every single day except when I take the day off. If I take a day off, I don't look at, you know, the I, I, I may look at some email or, you know, I, I touch on it. But it's not the most prominent thing that day. My like Sundays, you know, is doing this ministry with you, Scotty, which I am so grateful you invited me to do that. But the most important thing is for me the Sabbath, the Sunday, the seventh day in my calendar. And I don't know how we got Saturday to be the seventh day, but you know, let's just leave it at that. I I just really spend my Sunday doing the things that I love the most. And if we can help one person with a, one of my podcasts, one, I would be ever so grateful, you know, if we could help one person. I have sent our, my childcast out to so many people, and uh, a lot of people are just, they really like it. And we're going to put them, we're going to actually put them on our uh, biography so, uh, yeah, Reese is going to try to figure out how he can get it off of YouTube so we can put it on the, and, and that would be pro bono. We will not charge for that at all. It'll be just something else, someplace people can go and we'll see Reese is trying to work on how we can embed it right into the platinum biography as part of our life, you know, cause I talk about so many different things with you that I will be talking also in my biography. Did you, uh, cause I know that your, your mom was a believer, right? Your mom. Yes. Well, she was born, born Buddhist, raised Catholic and converted into Christianity later in years. Yeah. Did, did you have a moment in your life where you like found God like that? You would say like, cause you, you were raised that way, but was there mm -hmm. a moment where you like felt like you encountered God or you were like, that's the day I realized God was real. Did you have, uh, did you have uh, it, yeah, it's when I got baptized at 18, I think, uh, when I left the Catholic church and I, uh, got baptized at 18, I, I knew that I only had a couple of years left to live because I was really feeling quite, uh, quite ill. So that's when I ran into the minister at Wendell and his wife, and I wanted to learn how to get into heaven. And, uh, they started and I would spend time with them just one-on-one. -on -one. They could see how frail I was and they could see how ill I was. So they were willing to give me their time as often as I could come, which was almost every day. They would give me an hour or two every day and they would just tell me all about God. 
and, you know, my prayers changed and my desire for life changed. Everything changed. And then when they uh, asked me if I was willing to, to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I said, of course. Is that how? He says, yeah, well, you have to be uh, baptized through immersion. And that's when the water heater broke that night. And I didn't feel it. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, only to me, you know. But that is when I knew that was my wow moment with God. Was that when I could feel when they asked me right in, at their kitchen table. I can I'm, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit now. I was sitting there and they said, would would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your savior? And uh and I, it, I didn't even hesitate. I said, of course, I would, I would love that. And I could feel the Holy Spirit warming me. Like, and it was winter. And it was so cold. And all of a sudden, I felt just this warming. Like I'm feeling it right now. And it, and it changes you, you, the way you looked. I, I felt my eyes got brighter. My pain wasn't as severe on my skin. Uh, the things that were usually bothering me just sitting all of a sudden were just so neutralized when I said, of course. And so we scheduled my, my baptismal and, um, God, it was so cold and, and I didn't feel a thing. I didn't feel a thing in that moment except the warming of the Holy spirit. And I think once you give your life like that, um, there's no turning back. You can backslide a little. I did that, okay? I backslid and I thought, okay, let's go out and party, girlfriends, you know? And But I never really partied. I, I, I didn't, I've never been drunk and I've never done drugs. And so for me, I thought staying out to one o'clock in the morning was a sin, <laughs> even though I did <laughs> You know, I did. I thought staying out till one o'clock in the morning was a sin, but I learned not to do that on a Saturday night because Sunday morning I always wanted to hit Bible study, you know, and then hit hit the service. But uh, I did. I thought staying out late or having junk food at, you know, midnight was a sin. I really thought all those things. So um, I, I learned later on that all this guilt that I was feeling was not guilty things at all. You know, as long as you don't break the laws of the land and all this stuff. No, I've never done drugs and I've never been drunk, you know, that which would be a sin. And I was very, very heated about the belief system of the Ten Commandments and the Seven Sacraments. So I got pretty well versed early on, but I thought just staying out till one in the morning was a sin. So that's how innocent I was to all of the sinning thing. And, you know... Uh, my life changed. Uh, I was in my 19th year and I made a drastic change. I got rid of all the meds suddenly and um, I, I took my life into my own hands. And uh, my parents were very supportive. Uh, they didn't try to stop me because they knew and they could tell that I was very concerned that I would live to be 20 and I was 19. So I was going to do everything I could to make the 20, my, me going into my 20th year, make it as without drugs, without med medicine, without big farm, pharma. And um, I did everything with food. And so I'm here today to tell the story, which is, it shocks me when I say it out loud because I'm not 19 anymore. 72. I'll be 73 in March. So, and um, I'm living proof that there are miracles that happen every single day because every day I wake up is a miracle. So, were, for, were there key moments in your life where you were very aware that like God showed Himself in your life, like showed up and was like, I'm with you? And then was there also people that came in your life where you're like, this is deaf, like those people that you're talking about that you went to for yes. sure, right? Yeah, that, that was a mistake to how I met Wendell and his wife. I, I, I wish I could really remember the entire story of how I met. 
I think I just, I was driving around in a really small rural area and I saw a church. And I think I just walked in there and I think Wendell was there and he was the pastor and I told him, I, he said, I can, can I help you? And I said, I'd like to learn how to get to heaven. And he says, well, I'm on my way home. Uh, you know, have you eaten? And I said, no. He says, why don't you just follow me to my house? My wife is cooking. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> so, so uh, he, well, he took one look at me. He could tell that I was very ill. And uh, I just uh, said, okay. And I went to this stranger's home, and it was like we had known each other for so long already. But I, I, I figured this, and I learned this early on. If you don't risk anything, just like when I used to go with my dad, uh, I knew I wasn't supposed to be around a lot of things. But I risked a lot to find out exactly what my benchmark was. I, I used to just see what my personal best was to survive the day. And I used to just risk and risk and risk. And, and I, I, want, I wanted to see how far my body was able to go every single chance I got. So this was not unusual for me to, and I followed him in my car. And, uh, and we drove up and his wife came out and she had that, you know, apron on and everything. And it was uh, getting cold. Uh, I think it was, you know, early fall time at that time and leaving summer and uh, she came out and she greeted him at the door and I could see, I could see the love between them just bloom right in front of my eyes. And, and he introduced me to her. I wish I could remember her name. I can't remember uh, her name. Uh, she, and he says, I've invited her to uh, eat a meal with us. She goes, of course, you know, she, she let me, she let me come in and she sent me an extra plate and we were sitting at the table and we were talking and uh, Pastor uh, Wendell said, well, why don't you tell my wife uh, what you asked me? And I said, I, I just wanted to know if there was some sort of thing I could do to learn how to get into heaven. And then they wanted to hear my story. And I, I must have stayed there three hours uh, time went really by and they told me to come back tomorrow we'll start we'll start uh, on your journey to heaven basically and and they did they worked with me every single day and then I don't know for how many months because it was becoming winter and uh, Christmas was coming and all this and I was still going to their house uh, and um so I learned through them about, you know, how the path, the journey to heaven. And I was, I wanted to be prepared because I didn't know at that time as much as I do now, because I was told by uh, several doctors that I would be lucky because of the condition of, of my health and my skin, I would be lucky to see 20. And I wanted to make the best of it. So, but I heard about this kingdom, uh, God's kingdom, and I really didn't know that much about it. And, and Catholic, they don't, they talk about the kingdom of God, but they don't really, I wanted to know more about it, you know, life after death kingdom. And um, I thought I would try a different church. And they turned out to be Baptist. So I was, uh, I didn't really understand the name or anything I still don't <laughs> but that's they were just Christians and they knew I was Catholic and I was like a sponge I they gave me some books to read and of course you know me I, I read every book <laughs> they gave me and so I learned about God's kingdom after human life the promotion as I call it so yeah it was um it was probably, uh, you, you asked, you know, has, is there any wow moments with God? Every single day, um, when my 20th birthday came, um, 
every single day after that, every single day, I, I, uh, I know he was there. Or I wouldn't be here today. Every, there's not been a day, you know, uh, it's like when I was crying about my friend and I could hear enough. And then the, the thought came into my head. I needed to write uh, my friend's name down and put him at the foot of my crosses under my pillow. And God said I cried enough. I can hear him sometimes. I've seen him in people. Uh, he's, he's a, you know, he's a comedian and sometimes he, I'll say something like, you know, it would really be great if I could grow a little more or something like that. If I could be a little bigger and I can hear him laughing, walking away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually my relationship with God is a little different <laughs> because he is a comedian and uh, I, you know, the, I had all this, uh, you know, I don't color my hair. And it was so funny. I had all this gray hair in the front of my hair. I was so excited. I thought my hair was going to all turn gray because it's been blue black for so long. And I don't use color or anything. And only this little piece. And then suddenly the gray started coming in black again. I said, what is this about? You know, yeah. I said, what is this about? And, he, and I can hear him laughing. It's because of what I'm eating, I think, you know. Yeah, so, um, like I said, this was all, like, really great, but I don't, I don't go to a hairdresser or anything, and I don't color my own hair, and I, I just, I don't understand. Uh, people see my pictures, and when they meet me in real, they go, whoa, you know, <laughs> are you 35 or something? I said, no, I'm 72, honestly. I swear, to, I, you know, whip out my driver's license or my passport or something to prove my age and I tell you I can't explain it so yeah he's every day wow that's amazing because I've definitely gone through uh long periods of time where I mean I, I just didn't feel like God was with me you know and um uh so it's crazy to hear you say that every single day for 50 years you felt like God was with you and uh you know I Recently, I've had like all these amazing things have been happening at my job. And I told this girl in my church, um, Krista is her name. And she was like, this sounds a lot like this guy. Uh, Jamie Winship is his name. And she's like, look this guy up, this guy, Jamie Winship. And I was like, OK. So I go look this guy up. And one of this guy's things is that he um, he said that the two things that God says the most in the Bible, you know, like when people said, oh, there's this problem and, you know, is God's response would just be, I am with you. That's yes. all he says. You just say exactly. And then the second exactly. thing that he says the most in the Bible is fear not. Fear not. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> yeah, I know. So, I know. So amazing. I know. Like, it's but like, you know, but you've heard that saying that uh, I prayed for wisdom. You know, and God gave me problems to solve. Or I prayed for strength and God gave me problems to solve. And I prayed for this and 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 um, I that's what I did. I prayed for strength and I prayed for wisdom. And I tell you, uh, it wasn't like poof overnight. I was 100 percent OK after 20. I had to really work at it. I mean, I said, okay, let's see. If I if I eat skin because my skin is so bad, maybe that'll help. And I did, and it did. Uh, okay, now I need uh, to neutralize the scarring, so that's going to take antioxidants. So I ate a lot of green raw leafy vegetables. I ate uh, fruit away from all other foods. It just all this came automatically to me. What made sense? I started drinking raw milk. And it all made sense. I went back to infancy. I said, what do, what do you give a baby? When we were growing up, we had raw goat's milk, you know, straight from our goat. So I started drinking goat's milk raw, and I started drinking cow's milk because it, uh, it tasted better to me. And I started doing the raw uh, whole milk. 
and uh, I did the raw cream, I did everything, and I saw this huge improvement. And so by the time uh, all this happened, I was modeling, <laughs> I was being asked to model for photographers, and I did, um, you know, I'd model for an art class, and it was, uh, and the money was really good, so I was saved all my money so I can get more education. And most people say, why didn't you just stay in modern? I said, I didn't like it. I didn't, because I don't like mirrors. Today, even today, I don't like to, because I see that person I was. And I, and today I have a makeup mirror that's about this big. <laughs> and that's it. And I don't wear a lot of makeup, so it's very short-lived in the mirror. And I, uh, to this day, I'll never forget from whence I came. That's one of the things that I learned about God. Don't ever forget where he pulled you out of. Don't ever forget what he's done in your life and be grateful for every single day you've got. And I won't forget. I still, like I said, I still don't like to look in mirrors. I know what the photographs look like and I know all that. And I look at the photo, I said, this isn't me. And I walk away, you know, and, and I, I know it is, but you know, I don't see myself like others see me. And that's probably kept me safe from becoming too arrogant or too egotistical or forget from whence I came. And I think that's one of the things I said, whatever, you know, God give me wisdom, but don't ever let me forget from whence I came. And he hasn't. Because every day is a struggle for me. Every single day is a new day. And some days I'm good and some days I'm not so good. So I still take it with a grain of salt. I know what to do. And I know what to eat and what not to eat. And I know when to fast and when not to fast. All of these things came by just a trial and error of my own life. And that's why I'm really honored when people come to me that's normal. They're, they're so easy <laughs> to do <laughs> because there's nothing going on with them. And uh, so I'm able to just tweak their eating style a little bit. And I said, 28 days from now, you're going to be singing a totally different song. And I have yet to fail. So I've been honored that people still call on me. I tell them I'm retired, but a lot of people don't hear that. This is, you're too young to retire. I said, listen, I retired when I, <laughs> I was 59 years old. I'm 72, and I'm working harder now than I've ever worked. So, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, you do seem too young to retire. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I am retired. I really, I really, I really am retired. I just, you know, nobody hears me. You know, nobody wants to hear it. <laughs> That's so. Funny. You know, they're just it's like, like Tom. Tom doesn't want to hear it. That. You know, Tom doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to hear it. He goes, "You're not retired." You know. And he, something's going on with him, and I'll I'll talk to him about it. I said, you know, try this, try that, try this, and he does, and it works. So, you know, he won't let me retire as his doctor. No, <laughs> he won't let me do that. But it's uh, it's an honor. I'm I'm always grateful. I'm always grateful to to guide someone. I am not the message. I'm the messenger. So that when I meet a new body, I kind of ask him a few questions and God gives me the wisdom to remember how I can guide this person in 28 days, 29 days. Um, I can turn a life around and, um, to where if they keep doing what they're doing in about a year, they'll really feel much better in their own skin. And that's, that's all I'm supposed to do. I guide. I'm not the message. I'm just the messenger. He uses me. God uses me so much. He uses me, you know, for his work. And I think, like Denzel said, all this stuff that's been put inside of you by God is not meant to stay there. You're meant and designed to, to be a giver, to give it away. And that's what I've done. So I feel like every time I've given a life, um, a, you know, a breath of fresh air, that I'm giving an extra day of life myself. So it just, I think it's what you put into, 
to other people's lives is what comes back to you tenfold, I think. And I've been very, very honored and very, I'm, I'm always grateful for the knowledge, you know, and the amount of books and 500,000 hours, a half a million hours on clinical nutrition and healing and God and spirituality and the seven wellness, seven facets of wellness, 500. That's a lot of hours. And I still study. I still read. It's so crazy. Why don't I stop? <laughs> yeah. How could there not? <laughs> how could there still be more books to read? It's crazy. I, I that's one of the things King Solomon said, right? He's like, of many books, there is no end. It's just studying. There is no, it just no. And it doesn't matter what you read. You'll still get something out of it, a pearl out of it. It doesn't matter what is true or false or indifferent or written about with this, that, and the other. Even horror books, you probably get a lot out of it. I, I, I like to read about families. I read a lot of family, you know, uh, <clears throat> fiction books about family orientation on how people interact when they're it, I, I like to read about family and how they solve problems and uh, you know with each other and with other people I really like that so that's kind of my fave I've read most of the books I have uh, at least twice <laughs> you know I have like 700 books or something like that <laughs> so yeah, so I, I like to read it more than once because the first time I'm too excited about it and then the second time I think I get the most out of it. And some books I've read three times, so. Because yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, if it's a good book, I mean. Um, yeah. There's a really cool book, so my, uh, I'll just recommend it for you, you know, if you want <laughs> a good read. There's this book <laughs> called uh, The Journeys of Socrates. By the Journey of Socrates, yep. Have you heard of that book? It's written I've by heard of it. Milton. Dan yeah. Milton was a um he was a gymnast. Mm. He wrote this book and it's it's kind of like based off of the journals of his grandfather, I guess. Mm. His father had all these journals of like his life or whatever. And it's uh wow, it is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in this book because I read this book and I was like whoa this is this is really cool um so anyway I just you know if, if there's any chance you haven't read that book read it <laughs> okay I will I will I definitely will look it up so uh thank you for today this is a good day yeah good it's another day. good day good day and uh I guess we'll be on again next week Yep, next Sunday. Next Same Sunday. Place. Okay. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Thanks.